That'll be 7 o'clock here in the sanctuary, um, a week from now on a Monday night. We'd love to see you there. Um, Our summer picnic, starting off the outdoor services for the year, will be on June 9th. So June 9th, we're here outside, 10 o'clock for service, and then a picnic afterwards, and then we will be outside for the next few weeks after that. There is a sign-up sheet for food for the picnic. Um, that's in Capture Moment. It went out in an email. So if you would have interest in participating, there's not like a lot of things in there, but there's things that we need. And they're pretty simple things. So if you would have interest in helping out with the meal, that'd be great. Um, also on July 7th, so this is skipping the month of June, July 7th, we will not be having services here on Sunday morning. We always take that week off and invite you to experience the church in a different way. So I would encourage you to make sure you are participating in worship. Make sure you're encountering God's word. Make sure you're fellowshipping with believers but just do it in a different way. Maybe go visit another church and be a blessing there and receive from them. Maybe get some people together at your house and do church at your place in a different way. It's not a a week to not be a follower of Jesus. It's just a week to experience it differently. So that'll be July 7th. And then lastly, June 18th, um, the Factory Ministries is having a gala banquet. So the Factory Ministries is in Pequay Valley School District. It's a ministry that we work a lot with. They address issues of poverty, mainly. And Pequay Valley School District is like the poorest district in Lancaster County outside of the city, which means they have a lot of work to do and also means there's not a lot of support for them because there's not a lot of money floating around. So at this gala, a table to sponsor a table costs $1,000, and eight people get to go to it. So we would love to to be able to sponsor a table. We don't have a specific budget for it as a church, but we would love if individuals would contribute um, so that we could sponsor a table at that event. There are some people already interested, so if you would like to participate in that, um, talk to Lindsay, um, but we'd love to get that together. Whether you just want to give or if you'd like to give and go to the gala, um, that would also be a cool experience for you. So that's all I have for announcements, so why don't you stand up, greet each other, and we'll continue singing and praising the Lord together.
Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will.
give you all of the honor, all of our praise, all of our affection it belongs to you, Jesus. Thank you for being our strength when we're weak. Thank you for allowing us into your presence, allowing us to know you. We're grateful for who you are for this time to sing to you and to worship.
you are above all thrones, all dominions, all powers. Your mercy is good and your love endures forever. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your son. God, we're grateful. We thank you for today. In your precious name, amen. can come up a while for the offering. This is our regular offering. Let's bow together and offer this. Father God, you are good and trustworthy in every way. And so we worship you this morning in song. We worship you this morning by giving you our attention as we open your word. We want to hear from you. We want to be transformed by you. You are Lord of Lords, you are King of Kings, and you created us and you know us. And you want what's best for us, and so we submit ourselves to your word. Would you guide us? And we come this morning with offering because we want to participate in your kingdom, and you have allowed us and invited us to do so. So God, we give this not begrudgingly, but we give this with cheerfulness because we agree with your kingdom, and we want to see your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So God, would you use this offering and magnify it and use it for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys can go ahead. Well, good morning again. My name is Benji. I'm one of the pastors here. Somebody asked me this week where I most enjoy preaching. Is it Easter Sunday morning? Is it at weddings? Is it at big events where there's lots of people? And I thought about it for a minute because I wanted to give an honest answer, but my answer was very easy. My favorite place to preach is an average, normal Sunday morning at my church with my people. There's a time and a place for other things, But God has called us, God calls all people, to be the body together, to know each other, to share each other's burdens, to love and serve one another, and you are the people that I get to do that with. So thanks for being those people. I love being here and doing normal life with you as we all follow Jesus together. And part of what I love about preaching here is I actually know you. You're not just an ambiguous crowd. I know you as individuals. And you also know me. We have open communication. When the Spirit's really laying something on your heart, or when I say something really dumb that needs corrected, I want to hear that from you, and you do. We share that together. So I am called to preach and to provide some leadership here in this congregation, for sure. But I'm simultaneously a shepherd and a sheep. I also need the edification of all the body just as much as you do. After Jesus, we are, called, we are all to be called priests in the priesthood of all believers. We're in this together. I just use a microphone more often than some. So this morning and next week, we have a short break between our current stint in John and our series of testimonies in June. So this week and next, Keith and I are going to be talking about two topics that we thought are applicable to us as a body. I doubt either message is really going to rock your world or contain a lot of new information to you. We're not trying to correct a wayward audience. It's more of a conversation with the fam around the table. Or as Franklin Roosevelt called it, a fireside chat. Can you go back to the other slide? This is the vibe we're going for. We're having dinner around the, f- around the table together. We're talking about things that matter to the kingdom of God and our discipleship. So I hope you'll take these conversations home and continue the conversation with your family or whoever you do life with. Because we don't have a lot of black and white answers to these conversations. In fact, I'm not sure there are black and white answers to the things that we're talking about. We're just opening a conversation, looking at what the Bible says, and then hopefully getting the conversation started for you. Today, we're going to talk about disciple-making and children. Because this is something that applies to all of us. If there were no children at Timberline, this would still be a conversation that applies to all of us. 
As it is, there are lots of children here at Timberline, so all the more is something that we should be keeping in front of us. Jesus calls us in the Great Commission to go into all the world and make disciples of all people. Now that does mean all the world, and we should consider how each of us can participate in that global mission to the whole world. But all the world also very much includes this part of the world right here at home. And we're supposed to make disciples. In Jesus' day, a disciple was someone who followed a rabbi, a teacher or a master, kind of like an apprentice. Oftentimes, it included stopping your life, dropping what you do, maybe even leaving your home, maybe not, but actually following the rabbi around every day, learning to do life the way that he did it, knowing the things that he knows, practicing the disciplines that he practices, praying the prayers that he prays, loving the things that he loves. And rabbis naturally have followers. And so if, if a disciple is really going to become like his rabbi, in time, the goal of a disciple is to have his own disciples following him. Because if he's going to become like the teacher who's teaching, then you're going to have to teach, which means you have to have people following you. Disciple to rabbi. Or this morning, we're going to talk about infants and elders. I'm not sure where I came across this analogy first, if it was a book or a conversation, but someone talked about the process of going from an infant to an elder. Humanly speaking, on a human level, an infant is alive, but fully dependent on others. They can't feed themselves, they can't bathe themselves, they can't transport themselves, they have zero autonomy. An infant then grows into a child, a little bit of autonomy. Maybe they can feed themselves, hopefully. <laughs> Maybe they can tie their shoes, run around on their own two feet. So there's a little bit of autonomy there, but they're still mostly dependent. An adolescent then has increasing autonomy. Maybe they can drive. Maybe they even have a job, make some money. They take care of their own bodily functions. Praise the Lord, because that's a time in life no one wants to take care of bodily <laughs> But still, they live at home. They still need mom and dad real bad. So there's a lot of autonomy, but they're still dependent. An adult, then, is someone who is independent, self-sufficient, as much as anyone is self-sufficient in our culture, which is not really true. But they can, enjoy, they can still enjoy and benefit from their parents if they want to, but relatively speaking, this person can survive relatively on their own. Then there's a parent, an adult, who can also care for the needs of others. In addition to themselves, they can provide for and nurture a few, probably those who are naturally close to them. And then an elder is someone who cares not only for those who are directly associated with them or that they're directly responsible for, an elder cares for the greater community. This doesn't mean that they need to be on the city council or on the school board, but it's someone who is actively caring for their offspring and their neighbors and friends, but also caring about people who they have nothing to do with just because they care about serving anyone in the community and serving the world at large. So take this framework, this idea, and apply it loosely with a lot of grace to the life of a Jesus follower. Spiritually speaking, an infant is alive. They're born again. Someone who knows that they are a sinner in need of grace and they have trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior and King. Still very fresh, very vulnerable. Just beginning to read the Bible and kind of understand some of the basic principles. Probably pretty immature, but, but getting started. A child maybe reads the Bible on their own and they really like the Bible stories and they start to identify with some of the characters and the struggles that they're experiencing. They're hungry to learn more and grow and participate. An adolescent then maybe has some more autonomy. They're walking the walk. They're practicing the disciplines. They're growing in faith. Maybe they even have the boldness to share their faith with their friends. As Hebrews talks about, they're growing past just drinking milk and really chewing on the meat of the Bible. But when the hard questions get asked, they're still running back home to make sure they're safe and make sure they're on the right page. More autonomy, but still a little bit dependent. An adult then is someone who is confident in their faith. I would say independent, but this is where the analogy breaks down a little bit because none of us is ever fully independent. 
We need Jesus all the time. We need the body of Christ. We need fellowship with each other. But this person, they know their identity in Christ. When persecution comes knocking on their door, they're going to stand firm. When they hear false teaching or deception out there, they recognize the lie and they stand for the truth. They read and study the Bible on their own. And they're actively involved in the body of Christ, which means they read and study the Bible also with other people. A parent then is a step farther in t- intentionally sharing their faith with others and making disciples. Someone who not only can understand, but who can also can and chooses to teach and shepherd a few people around them. And then an elder is someone who cares about the kingdom of God at large, the global church. They've become more like their rabbi Jesus. Like he shared last week, their prayers, their focus, their time, and their energy have moved away from things that only matter to them and their friends and their benefit. They're actively focused on the mission of God and actively working toward making disciples of all people in all places. It's not a perfect analogy, but it's an interesting concept. And here's the deal. It doesn't matter where you fall on this spectrum. It's not a trophy or an achievement to earn. There's no worth assigned. This is just an observation of what happens as people continue to follow Jesus. The more you spend time in prayer, the more you spend time surrendering to God's word, the more you spend time following in the footsteps and the lifestyle and the heart of Jesus, these things will happen to you. You will progress through them. So there's no guilt or trophies if maybe you're at the top or at the bottom. And also to clarify, the Bible identifies elder as a specific office or role in the church. We have elders here at Timberline. That's not what I'm talking about. Not everyone will be an elder in a congregation, but we are all called to be elders like this. No one's off the hook in how we are called by Jesus to follow his example fully with all of our lives. We are all called to allow the Holy Spirit to use us in whatever way he chooses and participate in God's mission with the fullness of our lives and our time and our energy and our focus. And if we do that, we probably will look like an elder as time goes by. Again, I don't think we should marry this concept or we'll get distracted. This lineup is not in the Bible per se. But I do think it's helpful, it's a helpful tool for self-reflection. Where do you think you're at on the spectrum? Be honest with yourself. Don't be too critical. Don't be too arrogant. And then I would encourage you, ask others around you if you're brave. And I think you should be brave. And I think you should care about this. And I think you should ask other people around you, what do you see in me? And I think you should go to someone that you perceive to be a little bit farther along the line maybe than you are and ask them what they see in you. And wherever you fall, or you think you fall, acknowledge that Jesus is inviting all of us to be an elder because that's what Jesus is and we're called to follow his example. To be sold out for the global and eternal kingdom of God with all of our time, with all of our finances, with all of our life. That's where following Jesus leads. So wherever you are, what steps do you need to take to keep growing? You're not going to jump from child to adult overnight. There's nothing about fast growth in this at all. Discipleship takes dedication and discipline over a lifetime. Slow and steady. But even tortoises need to take the next step forward. So what's your next step forward as you continue to grow? I think many people become a Christian and think that that's all there is. We've arrived. We've crossed the line of faith. We are born again. If you think about that analogy of being born again, that means that's just the beginning. That's not the extent of what Jesus has called us to. Even people who are actively elders and have been for years, they're still aware of how much more they have to grow. In fact, elders, probably more than infants and children, know just how much they're not like Jesus and just how much more work there is to do in the kingdom of God. So even if you would identify as an elder, you're not done. You've got a long way to go. 
There's no room for complacency or for pride anywhere in the spectrum, top or bottom. And wherever we are, we should be intentional about encouraging and inviting those around us to progress through this as well. Whether that means sharing the gospel with someone for the first time or the 47th time because they don't yet believe, they're not even born yet, or if it's encouraging your friend or your child or the person sitting next to you to continue growing and digging deeper in God's word and trusting him in all things. Anyone who claims to be a follower of Jesus, this should be your full-time job. No exceptions. No questions, no wiggle room. To care about the mission of God with your entire life, more important than anything else, if you say you're following Jesus, this is you. If if this isn't you, you're not following Jesus. That's not a condemnation, just just an observation. If we're going to become like the rabbi, then we're going to become like the rabbi. And if we're not going to become like the rabbi, then we're not disciples. It's pretty simple. We are called to grow. As a paraphrase from John Mark Comer, this is also in your notes, said, people who follow Jesus are people who spend time with Jesus, are becoming like Jesus, and are doing the things that Jesus did. So if you call yourself a Jesus follower, in theory, that means you are someone who spends time with Jesus, you're becoming like Jesus, and doing the things that Jesus did. We are all called to grow from infants to elders. And we are all called to pray for and inspire and serve and lead others so that they can also grow from infants to elders. All nations, all people. God's mission, our mission. And this mission includes children as well. For sure, it includes more than children. We can't only focus on our kids. Our families shouldn't be a distraction from the kingdom of God at large but neither should the kingdom of God at large be a distraction from our families. The thing about kids that's different from your coworker or your friend or from young adults even is that kids can't reach out on their own. They can't read theology books. They can't listen to deep podcasts. And more than that, kids are incredibly impressionable and they pick up on everything that is happening around them. So they will pick up on what their parents do and on what their parents value. It's embarrassing sometimes what Alethea picks up from me. They will pick up on what their parents' friends value and on what their parents' friends do. What we as a church model for our kids and I say our kids collectively, is what our kids will grow up to expect to be normal in life. So if we model reading our Bibles every day, regularly praying and seeking God's will in all areas of our life, sacrificially serving one another, regularly praying for unbelievers and extending hospitality and generosity to the world, if we model Christ-like living as our top priority, our children will notice that. If instead we model sort of half apathetic devotions and rarely actually praying to seek God's will, we just kind of pray for the things we want. We use our free time mostly for our hobbies and interests and we spend most of our money on the things that we have like our house and our cars because those are very important and, you know, we, we fill our schedule with so many good things that we don't, we don't have time to be part of a small group at church. We can't do devotions every day. We can't serve our neighbors or go on that mission trip because we're just too busy. Our children will notice what's important to us. This responsibility of setting an example obviously falls largely on the parents themselves because they are the primary influences over their children, at least for a time. But it also falls to all of us because we are the church that our children will grow up around. We are the body that our children are supposed to learn how to fellowship with and serve with and be taught by and pray for and edify and participate in. So if they see all of us regularly kind of only half caring, our children 
will notice. And so even if the parents of the child are all in, kids will, they'll notice that their parents are the freaks and that normal Christians don't actually care that much because obviously look around. This responsibility belongs to all of us. And that's why we emphasize baby dedications because they're a great reminder. It is the parents' responsibility to raise their kids. It's also very much our responsibility as well. Jesus loved and wanted to reach all people. But he focused a lot on the vulnerable, the weak, and the forgotten. Children are vulnerable. Children are weak. Children are teachable. So there's a lot of hope. So parents, take this conversation home and talk about it. What are your children seeing in your life at home? What are your children seeing in your life at church? Are you busy and distracted and maybe even grumpy on Sunday mornings? Or you come out of your devotional time because somebody's crying and then you're like, ah, oh, why are you crying? You, you just came away from reading the Bible and you're going to start with that? Does it inspire you and bring you joy? Where do you as a parent identify on that spectrum list? And how are you growing? Do your children see you growing or is that something that you do in private? Do your children see you with your Bible? Do they hear your voice reading the Bible to them? Do they hear your voice praying? Not just for comfort and a good night's sleep and food gratitude, but for the kingdom of God to grow and for God's will to be done and for all nations to know Jesus as king and for us to be humbled and transformed into his image and used as we surrender our lives to him actively. Do your kids hear you pray that out loud? Honest evaluation, no condemnation. What are your kids seeing in you? Deuteronomy 11 talks about how we should make God's word a part of our lives. It says, You shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as a f the frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, talking of them when you are sitting in your house, when you're walking by the way, when you lie down, when you rise. You shall write them on the doorposts and on the house of your house and on your gates, when you're coming into your house and when you're walking out of your house. Use this as a rubric for your home. Not a law, but an inspiration. In Joshua chapter 4, after God led the Israelites miraculously across the flooding Jordan River, he instructed them to build a memorial so that when their children see it, they will ask, what's that about? And then you'll have the opportunity to share with them what God has done. There's another great idea. Keep symbols of testimonies around your house in your car. Every time you drive past that one place or you see that one person, tell your children again the story of how God has led you and provided for you and blessed you. Make these things a habit in your life. It'll bless you too. And again, get together with your friends, ask them how they do it, ask them what they see in you, go to an older couple that you respect and ask them how they did it. The Bible says that children are a blessing from the Lord. That's not a guarantee that you will love parenting and that your children will turn out cute and blessing-y. I know many parents whose children have brought them much grief. I've seen the greatest and most intentional, prayerful parenting result in rebellious children who do what they want. And I have seen God redeem terrible, even hateful parenting. God redeems it with the fruit of of wonderful kids. But the principle applies to all. Children are a blessing from God. But as Ephesians 6.4 says, they need to be brought up in discipline and instruction of the Lord. And this does not happen by accident. We don't just stumble across a disciplined life. It takes, wait for it, Discipline. Still no guarantee for perfect kids, but this is our calling nonetheless, to raise our children, Timberline Church, to raise the collective children of Timberline Church in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. 
But very important note here for us as a body. For those of us who don't have kids, or maybe your kids are grown or whatever, but for those of us who don't have kids, you are not left out. Neither of the responsibility nor of the blessing. You also are called to make disciples. You are just as much called to intentionally pour into the lives of others around you, to serve and lead others to follow Jesus more. Yes, your adult coworkers and your neighbors and your friends, and also children. I know a lot of people who really wish they were parents, who wish they had the opportunity to raise their own little disciples at home. And for whatever reason, that's not what God had planned for them. Even so, there is blessing and opportunity and responsibility for you. There's this beautiful passage in Isaiah 54. I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation. It says, Sing, O child, this woman. You who have never given birth, break into loud and joyful song, O Jerusalem, you who have never been in labor, for the desolate woman now has more children than the woman who lives with her husband, says the Lord. Enlarge your house, build an addition, spread out your home and spare no expense, for you will soon be bursting at the seams. Your descendants will occupy other nations and resettle the ruined cities. And you should go home and read the rest of the chapter. Now this passage can be interpreted on multiple levels. It's talking about the nation of Israel growing and prospering and the inclusion of the Gentiles. But it's also just as applicable as, as it plainly sounds. To the barren, to the childless, as you devote your life to following Jesus fully and surrendering your time to love and serve those around you, your house and your life will be flowing with offspring whether you call them spiritual children or just your friends. Many of the people who have most significantly blessed me in my life and called me up and discipled me were not my parents, although my parents also did that. They were other members of the body. And I look to them as spiritual parents who have really poured in. And I think on an actual spiritual level, somehow they are responsible for my discipleship. They are my parents. And Many of the most thrilling and joy-filled moments of disciple-making, seeing the Holy Spirit transform and bless other people's lives, have been with people who are not my children. And that's not only because my children are young. God wants to use all of us, and if we choose to surrender to his plan, he will use us. He will fill our homes with children, perhaps literally. And maybe in his providence and wisdom, perhaps not literally. But it's no less wonderful It's no less challenging. It's no less our responsibility and our calling as disciples of Jesus. But one more element to this conversation that is, again, applicable to us here at Timberline is that an important aspect of discipling our children is inviting them and making room for them to participate in our corporate gatherings. And I don't mean in their kids' classes. I mean right here where we gather to sing, to pray, to hear God's word, to talk about theology, to fellowship together. Kids need to not only be exposed, but actively be brought into participation in this setting right here. In Deuteronomy and in Joshua and in Ezra and in 2 Chronicles, all of these books tell stories about times when Israel, all of Israel, gathered for an assembly. Sometimes to read the entire Torah in one sitting. That's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, which in English takes about 14 hours. They would gather for general assembly, and every single one was present. It specifically says men and women and the little ones. So that they may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God and be careful to do all the words of his law and that their children who have not known it may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God. Children can often understand more than we give them credit for. And beyond just the teaching, they pick up on everything. The songs, the emotions, the interactions between people. 
hearing God's word read out loud. Here at Timberline, we want our kids to be a part of the whole church body, not just friends with the kids that are their age. Because children are not the church of tomorrow. They are here. They are the church of today, just as much as you are. Some religious sociologists would say that kids' classes during the service on Sunday morning started as a creative solution in trying to get baby boomers back to church in the 70s and 80s. You know that generation who went through the sexual revolution and gave up a lot of things? They were trying to get them back to church, and so the best way they could is to remove all the distractions. We'll babysit your kids. It's fine. Just get into the church. And you know what? In a lot of ways, it's great. It's not inherently bad. But an unintended side effect of that is that ever since then, we have been raising completely unchurched children. Kids who are only used to going to class. And so after they graduate high school, they have no tie to the church. They have no friends with anyone who's not their age. They have no experience or love for corporate worship or hearing God's word preached, if it's not specifically to their age group. And so the younger generations have been leaving church after graduation like it's going out of style. Again, that's not to say that kids' classes are bad. I don't think that. I think kids' classes are very valuable. But we should still be intentional about discipling our children into every aspect of our faith. So one of our strategies here at Timberline is that we have two services. So that it's at least an option for families to go to one service fully together and then also go to class if they would like. Parents can go to the Bible study that's happening during second service, or they can fellowship with their friends. This is, again, a task for all of us together. We need to be a congregation who welcomes children. And you know what children do? Children make noise. And sometimes that's uncomfortable. It's up to us to work at staying focused and choose to not be distracted and choose to focus on what the preacher's saying. And when we can't do anything but be distracted, to have grace for those moments, because sometimes it happens, friends. Sometimes it doesn't take a child for you to get distracted. Fun fact. We are glad kids are present. As a preacher, I'm glad to hear kids alive sometimes. Maybe if y'all said some more mm-hmms and amens and stayed a little bit more engaged, the children wouldn't feel the need to break the silence of the grave. <laughs> half joking, half not. On the other hand, 1 Corinthians 14 talks about worship gatherings and said that they should be orderly and not chaotic. Realistically, here at Timberline, we're in a very small space. And what happens in this corner is heard in that corner, and vice versa. <coughs> one screaming child can really disrupt a whole service, and one kid can make everyone not pay attention. So we want to walk the line with grace on both sides. For parents, crinkly snack bags, noisy toys are just not meant for the sanctuary. There's lots of quiet toys in the nursery if you need to go grab one because you forgot one at home. Kids make noise and that's okay. But if you're continually distracted, probably so is everyone else around you. If it's consistent or very loud, help the whole congregation focus on worshiping Jesus together by removing your child when necessary. And consider whether your child's old enough to really participate. Yes, we want all kids in here, but like your nine-month-old or your two-month-old maybe isn't like really picking up a lot on the sermon. Maybe the nursery is a better age or a better option at this age. And then, but then, as your children grow, this is key. Think about how you can engage them in the service and not only entertain them with books and toys to distract them from the service. Kids are often capable of a lot more than we think especially if we prepare them ahead of time. Talk through expectations before you come. Maybe practice singing our songs, the things that we, songs we normally sing, practice singing them at home. Practice sitting quietly while listening to a story for a whole half hour. At home, it might feel ridiculous, but practice. It'll pay dividends at church. There's a lot more great ideas, tips, history, and theology in this little, I'm going to call it a booklet. It's kind of a book. There's a bunch of these, or a few of these, out in the, on the kidsmen wall in the cafe. Feel free to grab one. Take it home. Read it. Keep it. If you want another one, we'll buy more. If you want some more ideas, there's some great ideas in there. So again, go home. Talk about this with your spouse. 
How are you doing? What's going well? What needs improvement? Should you be treating Sunday morning the same way that you are, or should you be treating Sunday mornings a little bit differently? And to the rest of us, we want our kids to be here. We want to participate in their discipleship journey. So I don't care if you're 75. Talk to the two-year-old. Talk to the awkward 11-year-old. Talk to the teenager who looks like they would rather die than talk to you because they need to have connections to the body of Christ beyond just their peer group who is as immature as they are. It is your responsibility as the bigger man or woman to make disciples here at Timberline, regardless of how fun it might feel in the moment. We agree to this every time we stand at a baby dedication, and we should rejoice that we have children here. So let's have a lot of grace and a lot of intentional interaction and support. I hope that this morning is just the beginning of the conversation for you and your family. Take it home. I mean it, folks. Take this home, and the next time you're eating a meal with other human beings, whoever that is, talk about it. Where are you at on that spectrum scale? Ask them what they're seeing. Ask them how they're growing. Ask them how they think you can grow and talk about it. Come up with some new ideas. Walk away with a plan. Think about how you can be intentional about leading others along that journey as well. Share, ask for feedback, and then pray together about it. Maybe that's going to be really uncomfortable because you've never done something like that before. No time like the present to start doing it. Like Keith said in his sermon last week, are we living for whatever makes us comfortable? Are we praying for whatever makes us comfortable? Or are we on God's mission, his will, his kingdom come? God loves the whole world, and he welcomed the little children. And he has called us to give our lives to love the whole world also. He is inviting us further up and further in. Will you follow him? Would you stand for a prayer together today? Our Father in heaven, you are holy and just and righteous in all ways. Jesus, you are holy and worthy of all honor and glory and power forever. Your love, your sacrifice, your example, we worship you. Holy Spirit, we are powerless without you. Only you can lead us and teach us and help us grow. We need you. We need your word alive in us. Our God, would you fill us, equip us, empower us, convict us, and give us the grace to move forward with precision, to move forward with mercy, to move forward with your spirit anointing, to make disciples, to be disciples, to walk in deeper intimacy with you. We need you. We need you. We need you. Only you are holy. Only you are worthy. Guide us as a congregation to glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace.